Hey there, Julia Barbaro here, host of the Julia and Gino podcast. I'm here with the co-founder of Jake and Gino, my husband and co-host, Gino Barbaro. Julia, we're doing pretty good because we got two mics now. We we levered up from one yeah. now to two. We it's, got a nice studio It's kind of nice because usually when we have one mic, when when you talk too much, I kind of slowly <laughs> push you over a little bit. <laughs> it's is time that to what move it is? On. Yes. So now I can't do that. So I have to you learn. do the dance, do, leaning yeah. in, leaning out. You guys have this beautiful dance. You should actually take tango <laughs> lessons. That would be my <laughs> recommendation. That's we right did. Today. That's right. We took tango before we got before we got married. And so. Morgan, if you will humor me today, I will even sing a little opera oh, later. Come on, please. please. Let's keep it real. Oh, everyone needs a little joy ball. And Morgan wants to hear me. Julie doesn't want to hear me. I mean, anyway, today's guest is Morgan Snyder, founder of Become Good Soil and director of strategy at Wild at Heart. In his latest book, Becoming a King, he teaches us how to become spiritually mature enough to accept the invitation to become who we really are. He serves as a strategist. I like that entrepreneur, teacher, writer, grateful husband of 20 years and a proud father of two beautiful children. Welcome to the show, Morgan. Uh, thanks, Gino, Julia. Yeah, really honored. It was great to dialogue before the show and just really um, passionate about what's been entrusted to your care and just honored to have some conversation about things that really matter mm. to the heart of God and matter to a lot of hearts around the globe. How did you become passionate about fatherhood? And give us a little bit of background of your story. Your story. Yeah, it's a pretty wild journey. As I was just thinking back into this podcast recording, I realized I journeyed with John and Stacy Eldridge, author of Wild at Heart and Captivating. We've been together for almost a quarter of a century. So John finished writing Wild at Heart in a rented minivan in the back seat, the third seat, driving to officiate our wedding in the year 2000. And it's just the wildness of God. But I think what I would say in all that, Gino, what I came to realize, I went through a profound transformation in the college years at university where I sort of lived the verse. I won the world and I lost my soul. And I looked at the mirror and asked that question of who have I become? And who am I becoming? And I, I got really concerned um, about the, the lack of true trueness. And through that, I came into a relationship with God, which was genuine and beautiful. But what I found is I sort of walked through my 20s and pursued a woman and began a family and began a career. Though I was a man, there were parts of me that were still a boy. And so I was showing up in a man's world, but what I was lacking was what I would name initiation into wholeheartedness, that there was still an eight-year-old Morgan and a 13-year-old Morgan. And Sherry and I, in our early years of marriage, we would, we would wrestle over really important things. And what I came to realize through lots of counseling and lots of soul work, lots of integration is it's really hard when two eight-year-olds are trying to make big financial decisions. It just doesn't go that well. We're deeply in love and we've been through hell and back and we're 23 years in, in our marriage and in our work in the world. And what I've learned is that a life of faith is far more than simply a confession of faith, a momentary choosing. It, it is also a path and a process to restore the whole human being and what we believe passionately to restore men as men, women as women, to restore marriages, to set the lonely in families and to begin the redemptive work on earth as it is in heaven in our homes. And then from that place of, of well-being, of nourishment, of secure attachment to go and love a very broken world. And so that's where it began. It was asking a lot of questions, taking the lower seat and learning to unlearn so that I could find who God truly is. Morgan, when you say quarter of a century, my wife and I this year are married a quarter of a century. Way and to go, you guys. It, it <laughs> sounded painful the way you said it. it and, and, and there's time. some pain in a quarter of a century there. I'm going to tell you. It's, it's a <laughs> lot. It's a lot. And you know what? It's, it's also the best things in life yes. take time. Right. right. I mean, nature in the sacred text we've been given, we live in a world of of up and to the right, more and more, faster and faster. I mean, Gino, you know this in the marketplace with you and Jake of like, it's always more. It's shortcuts. It's 
you know, the shortest line possible and in the kingdom of God in, in maturation and growth doesn't work that way. It's the slow and steady. It's live in the day and measure in a decade. And so when I was a young man, a decade felt, felt like an eternity. And now as I look back over a quarter of a century, I, I go, it's, it's good to feel right on time and to align with the true nature of reality rather than fight against it. So mm -hmm. I celebrate that. I now hear that with affection when I didn't in a younger season. What is authentic masculinity? Mm. What, what a big <laughs> question. Here, here's how I'd respond to that, Gino, is we live in a world with a lot of answers, but what we've lost are the questions. Most young men, talented men, you go in the marketplace and you see this with men and women, there's a lot of answers. There's a lot of exclamation points. And what I find is recovering the path of true masculinity and true femininity is when we begin to ask questions. We begin to recover the ancient questions and it usually happens through pain. You know, Dallas Willard, one of my mentors, I love his phrase. He says, reality is what we bump into when we're wrong. <laughs> I just love that phrase. I ran into a glass wall. I was at a high rise facility, moving furniture for a friend's dad who was property manager there. And I never saw the wall, but it was real. And I turned into a raccoon. My face was black and blue. That was real. And so what I would say is, what are the questions? Questions like, why do most men feel like I'm behind about everywhere from my relationship to my finances, to my yard? What, why do men feel like so many things aren't working? Why do so many men make so many decisions to avoid failure? And so I would say it's a very sacred question that I wouldn't want to slap a quick answer on, but I would also say it's one of the most important answers we must recover if we're to find the life that we're meant to live. Wow, that is an incredible answer. Really beautiful. What do you think, Julia, as a woman, yeah. when you hear me say that, where does your heart go? Well, you know, you, you mentioned, and I think a lot of times we get caught up in life and we don't ask those questions. We forget about them or we don't even know to ask them. You know, what you were just saying is probably something, you know, maybe my husband has never asked himself or even me. Um, and I think our journey, you know, when you mentioned being married 25 years, my gosh, that's so long. But at the same time, it's not. And when we think back to where we were, like our faith's journey is just, I mean, it's incredible where we, mm. where we started and to where we are now. And we're on different, we're on different paths at times, you know, because I'm trying to figure it out. A lot of times we put our marriage together and we're trying to work on our marriage and we forget to work on ourselves as well. Yes. So me yes. as a woman, you know, you, you have children, we have six children. And so over the years, you kind of get lost into that, <laughs> you know, and you kind of forget about yourself. My husband's busy with work. He forgets about himself. And I think a lot of times we focus on everything around us and we forget about ourselves. And I know that God's timing is so good because you're here and you're, you're asking those questions to us. Mm. And I think that's incredible. Yeah. It's really beautiful, Julie. I, I, that I'm sure there are a lot of listeners that feel the pain of they long to yeah. be authentic, right? Absolutely. Of course. And like you said, six kids and career, and all of a sudden, 25 years, like the the days are long and the years are short, and you yeah. you come to this precipice. And yet, in that, what we find is we offer who we've become. You know, you look at our parenting for better and worse. Mm -hmm. We're simply offering. We're discipling. We are shaping, educating our children out of the sum and total person we become. So you think of your first child compared to your sixth child. Mm -hmm. And if they had to write down, what was it like to be parented by mom? And I think, right, there probably will be a, a lot of similarities. And then there'll be some distinctions going, oh man, I'd love to meet your mom, right? <laughs> because you were different people. 
Absolutely. And in some ways, that's the most hopeful thing because in yeah. a world of chaos and a world that's fast and furious and mm-hmm. ever changing is our new normal, the one thing that has the most influence is the one thing we have most control over. We get to control the kind of person we become. If we really believe that God is the center of the story, that he's the author, and that the first act is always God, and our first act is always a response, there's just an ease to it. There's a settling in and a curiousness that that lifts from my heart. And I even think of your story, you guys, of now as you transition 25 years with, with these six kids becoming adults, yeah. you know, slowly, like it's a new season to really take mm-hmm. with joyful sobriety of what's next for you as sons and daughters. Exactly. What's your frontier? Where do you get to be challenged and, and get excited and be curious in your apprenticeship so you can keep modeling to your kids, you know, becoming like lifetime learners and lovers? Yeah, that's beautiful. I, yeah, I, I think back when you said about the difference of, parenting or even as a spouse early on compared to now. We do talk about that. Our oldest mm-hmm. is 23. Our youngest is eight. So we do have those conversations at time. And when I look, I, I was parenting out of fear, basically. Mm-hmm. You don't want to mess the kid up. You want to do everything right. And now I'm actually, it's more of a surrender. Do you know what I mean? It's a, you know, I have these beautiful kids. They're such gifts and I'm just guiding them into adulthood. And it, as a mom, it's very free, freeing feeling yes. to say yes. that they're not mine. You know yes. what I mean? They're not my possession, that I own them, but they're going to be out. I mean, our oldest is a missionary. I mean, I don't know. I guess we did okay. <laughs> you know, it's beautiful. But, but you know what I mean? And I think there's that fear of letting go of that fear, truly letting go and truly trusting God. A lot of times we say we do, but we're not living the life, as you said. Are we living the life? And that really is, you know, basically every decision we're making, every choice we're making, you know, what we what we let our mind wander to. You know what I mean? All of that is okay. Every moment is an opportunity, in a sense, to trust God. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yes, my love. What is your thoughts here? <laughs> I figured you'd be talking the whole time because no. we're basically talking about men, but at the same time. I, this is what I wrote down because I this was important to me. And a lot of times as women, as wives, we we feel like we know you guys. You know, and I read this book and I'm like, wow, I really don't know much about men. Mm. <laughs> so when I read Wild at Heart, I'm like, every woman really needs to read it because it, it was almost as if I was reading about, you know, you as men, but as little boys at the same time. Mm. You know, and I think we forget that you are a little boys in the, at heart sometimes, and you do need to be out in the wilderness and living that life. And a lot of times we want you to grow up in a sense. Mm. We want you to be that responsible, that that man at home and just being strict. And you know what I mean? We just, we forget that that little boy in you is still living. And I Boy, love that about you. I'm so you. glad this is recorded because I'm going to be using I that do. Again <laughs> you know, I, I love how, it, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree just about the, the wilderness out there, why boys love to be in the woods. That's, I mean, just that alone. That's what I want to ask you, Morgan. Man, instead, you know? of, instead of me asking, answering her, Julia's question, in the book, you know, there's about well, the three core desires. But well, John, in, the, in the Wild at Heart book yeah, you're talking John, yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, how were men designed? Let's, 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 let's decipher that. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I guess any women he, hearing this would be like, oh, wow, that, nah, that's why. That's why it's always a competition. That's why when we get in the car, <laughs> he's got to beat me at mm. home. That's mm. why he can't play a game without making put, put, put it's up the It's so stakes. helpful, ladies. <laughs> Learn about men. I mean, it is you, they are so reality. different than us. Game and on. I love and, it. Love and, it. Go big or go home. And <laughs> men yes, learn about women. Yes. And yeah. men learn about women. Become students yeah. of right. women because this co-creative process. There's Gino. Mm -hmm. There's Julia, but when they come together, there's a third Mm. entity. It's literally a living, breathing entity, a union that never existed before, that generative power of covenantal love. And so, yeah, when we talk about masculinity, I think an access point for our listeners that's really helpful is where do women go when they feel bad 
when it goes south? What do they struggle with? What do they fear compared to men? When you get to the core of where does where's fear or shame rooted? And I'll just and and here and and so friends, like I want to be really careful because I don't want to talk in stereotypes. I don't I'm I don't want I don't want to be in caricatures. And I'm not saying black and white. And here's what I mean. In the mystery and the wildness of God's heart, from the life of God, this Trinity, this community of persons flowed male and female. God said, in our creation, in our image, man and woman came from. So so friends, think about this. God is the headwaters of everything masculine and everything feminine. And so anything good, true, and beautiful that has the aroma of true masculinity or true femininity comes from the heart of God. This is so essential. I mean, you go to Isaiah 66 in the message, and it's provocative stuff. God says, I will nurse you. God says, I will bring you to my breast, and you will be covered in milk overflowing. You will burst with joy and feel 10 feet tall. You ask most men, and Gino, you know this in the marketplace, you ask most men when they feel 10 feet tall and burst with joy. And if you line up 10 men, at least nine of those stories will be about accomplishment. They will be about conquer. They will be about winning. Whether it's chess or harvesting a, an animal with a, with a bow or a rifle or being right, okay? But you look at Isaiah 66 and it's saying something more fundamental. Oh, you were meant to feel 10 feet tall and burst with joy. But below success was this abiding, secure attachment that when that child is so nourished by feminine love, held at the breast, nourished, robust well-being, eye-to-eye contact, gaze, affection, and delight, when that boy feels that, when he can go away from mom, knowing he can always return to safety, He's blessed because he exists. He becomes that acorn in fertile soil that doesn't need to be told, become an oak tree. He becomes an oak tree because he's been nurtured and satisfied. So what I want to name, femininity and masculinity have deep distinctions, and yet they both come from God. And so there is overlap and there is nuance and there's mysteries. And every story is unique, even though we are universal in the human experience. So I give that as prologue to say, I want to be kind and avoid stereotypes. Having said that, if you look, most men fear failure at a fundamental level that's different than a woman. Now, every, every woman feels failure, but not in a way man does, whereas mm-hmm. most women fear abandonment. There's some sense of a relational essence that's their greatest fear. Most women, when they're fired, don't kill themselves. But you look at the statistics and most suicides from being fired are men. Most mass shooters are not women. There's some fundamental aggression that's something holy that's gone terribly wrong. And so when you look at the heart of a man, John told us it this way that I loved years ago. He said, a man sees everything in the world as a man. And a woman sees everything as a woman. I can't see like a fish. I love fish. I spent a lot of time in wilderness settings watching fish. I'm not a fish. I'll never know what that's like. <clears throat> but I can be students of them. I can learn and appreciate and benefit from them, but I'm not a fish. And so when you come with that humility, my wife shops like a woman. She has relationships like a woman. She thinks like a woman. She cooks like a woman. She thinks about Thanksgiving like a woman. That takes immense humility on my part to say, I'm not a woman. 
okay? And therefore, I want to learn. And so again, we're back to questions. Mm -hmm. What are the questions that help us really understand what God was after when he said, I want to make them just like me, and I'm going to express them as men and women and bring them together in this generative love. So now that we're in, in the society right now, you're, I, I can understand why you're so passionate about family, because if there's a breakdown mm -hmm. where there are single mothers or single fathers and there's no unity or there's no mm -hmm. connection there, that really harms the, the, the child. I mean, can you take that one step further for those of the people out there trying to struggle with their relationships? I mean, maybe they should look at it f from from that perspective and saying, hey, it really comes down to, I mean, our relationship, looking at it at what God created, you know, we shouldn't really try to break apart. And also, I, I think for the for the children, I think children really suffer tremendously when when that happens, when they see the dad leave. And yes. even though dad's saying, I, I, I still love you, John or Mary, I'm just I'm just, you know, we're just getting separated. I think that takes a significant toll on the children because they know or they feel that dad's leaving them, not just leaving mom. Absolutely. It's just such a profound trauma that often is latent that doesn't get triggered until later in life. It's mm -hmm. fascinating the correlation with the number of young moms in their 30s that come to a revelation of sexual abuse in their childhood that they didn't they weren't aware of consciously until their children are the age they were when that incident took place and it triggers something in them and so no doubt we live in a traumatized culture but let me start with design because this really helps when you you look at little boys you look at little girls and you see in them a mago day it it hasn't been beaten out of them and the fall only has so much reach you know Boys want a battle to fight, right? They want to fight for something and with someone, for something greater than themselves. Even if it's lived out in video games, there's something in them that says, I want to conquer. I want to risk. I want to adventure. Most boys use social media for that adventure and that battle. Most girls use social media socially, relationally, for communication, expression, for connection. Again, these are not to, meant to be gross overstatements, but in general, there is massive correlation. There's outliers, but there's correlation. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so if we begin with what, is a mo what does a boy need from mom that's different than what he needs from dad? Mom provides self-worth. Mom provides the, the benediction of, of existence, of being, blessedness. You are love because you exist. I choose you and it's unearned. As I say to my daughter, you know, there, there's nothing you can do that will cause me to withdraw my delight. There's nothing you cannot do that'll cause me to withdraw my delight. That sort of delight was meant to be rooted in what I received from mom, that secure attachment. You are loved. You are worthy of belonging because you exist. And then she's meant out of this well-being, this nourishment, this overflow to bless his masculinity and let him go, always to return for blessing. But most moms... Boys do not receive the secure attachment they need. And so therefore they have this profound question. Am I loved? Am I worthy of love? And so deep in them, friends, like it that if that question's not answered, you will go searching all your life to restore secure attachment. With masculinity, it's really different. Much of it happens in the developmental stage around three years old, where a boy begins looking to dad. And there's a lot of crossover with girls. We're just talking about boys. <coughs> a boy looks for dad's face, and dad's face is meant to tell him who he is. There's no distinction between the face of the father and the face of God. What we really believe about God as a father is formed profoundly three years, four years, five years, seven years. 
And there's something that's like validation. It's something like you have what it takes. You can do this. You're so deeply loved. You can risk and fail and still be okay because failing is the building blocks of masculine well-being. That's how we were supposed to be initiated. So if you have a boy who's been saturated by feminine love, who has deep, secure attachment and is steadily released and blessed by mom because mom's not taking her question to the son to answer for her worth. And she's not looking for the emotional connection that she's not receiving from her husband. Okay. There's a lot of ifs in that. Mm. So you have that boy. And then he has a dad that through affection and through touch and through discipline in love, through invitation, curiosity, through adventure and daring, he knows I have what it takes and I am the delight of my father's heart. You have the building blocks of a person that can go out and learn my life is for others, my strength is for others. My power is meant to be in the service of love. And so, Gino, it's a big wraparound to your question of so much of what you see in the world is where that's been broken. And the brilliance of the heart of God is that he is a good, good father and a compassionate, nourishing mother, and that we can actually repair and restore all these places of trauma, these places that were stolen, lost, and surrendered. We can get that back. And we we can become the sons and daughters that we were meant to become through the life of God. And it's really, really hopeful. Yeah. So there's a link there. You have the link between God, the father, the wife, and the child. And I always mm-hmm. say to myself, why are they damaging that relationship? The media, uh, uh, you know, politics, whatever it is. And all you have to do is go back and listen to the last five minutes of it. And the answer to that would be to have a weak family unit. And then all of a sudden you have so many problems. And then all of a sudden they're dependent upon something or someone, which is the government, which is giving handouts, which is universal basic income. And then all of a sudden they become the family. They become the family unit. How can you send your child to school and they're three or four years old and you know nothing about what's going on and their property of the state, their property of the family, but it seems as if that's being perverted and changed. And, you know, what you just said right there just reaffirms my feelings and my conspiratorial thoughts as, as they may be. I don't think they're conspiratorial because what you just said is you laid it out. If you weaken that, all of a sudden we feel confused, we feel unloved, and we go look for love or affirmation elsewhere. And where do we go? We go to social media where they hook you, and then we go to listen to all these other sites, and then all of a sudden one thing leads to another, and then the government has you. Hmm. What are your thoughts, Julian? Well, I kind of want to go to the restore part. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, I'm going dark. Well, no, you, you see, that's why you're a dream team, you guys. It, it Every Gino always, needs yeah. a Julia. Always Every always Gino always. needs a Julia. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, because oh, I'm not. I'm not going to punch the screen. I'm, I'm, I'm no, relaxed. I know. You're, I'm you're calm. Good. I'm, calm. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm good. <laughs> because there are so many broken families, and maybe as of you know, within the past 20 years or so, it really, what a difference compared to before, maybe, I'm sorry, even longer when I was younger. Um, But there's so many of us, I was from a single parent home as well. And it does affect you. It does affect your mothering. It affects you as a spouse. You don't even realize it. You're just kind of like, why do I have these fears of abandonment? And that's very common. I speak to a lot of women and and now I understand a little bit more, but I would actually want you to, to touch on that a little bit and then also we'll get into. I was just going to say, now. you got you got, you hit the lotto, baby. That's okay. You didn't know abandonment <laughs> here, so <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, yeah, and I I come to you, Julia, with compassion to see that you came from a single family home, and like look at your life, look at the repair, look at the mm-hmm. restoration, look at these six thriving young people, look at this healthy marriage, and look at the overflow you're bringing life generative life to me and to many. It's a picture of the gospel. You know, it's in the Psalms. It's one of my favorite Psalms, this promise where where David says he sets the lonely in family. He sets the orphan in family. So much of the work of the gospel, you know, it's communal. 
as much as it is an individual, we live in a hyper individualized culture. We have personal economies, right? Personal calendars, personal church. Like that wasn't the culture for most of human history. It's communal. And so let me give an example. My precious little fire um, princess, Abigail, turned 16 a couple weeks ago. She bought a car and we were, you know, teaching her just the things. What do I wish I would have had? Much of my parenting flows out of offering in love what I wish I would have had. And so we did some car lessons. We made it light and we made it fun, but she's changing a tire. And she broke one of the lift gate struts on the back of her hatch on her little 2002 Highlander. And she had one of her girlfriends over that um, this young gal in her class is really struggling at home. Parents are fighting a lot. She's trying to get out early. And I had this beautiful moment where I wanted to teach my daughter how to fix this liftgate strut, but she's fixed a lot of things. And so I think she could probably do it without me, but we folded in this other girl I'll call her Kelly. And as I'm working with both of these women, it was just such a, it's such a feminine moment. They both have puffy slippers on that are like, like flowing pink silk and, and they, they don't look like mechanics, you know? And here I am like, you know, just trying to invite them into a piece of initiation. If you're going to have a car, this is part of your domain to steward. I want you to have a sort of mastery over it. I want you to steward it well and in love and care. And I realized this young girl, Kelly, she had never used a socket wrench. She had never used pliers. She she didn't really even know like righty, tidy, lefty, mm-hmm. loosey. And here I was folding her in as a daughter. I wasn't the substitute for her parents, but God was fathering her in that moment through me. And my daughter was better because of it. He sets the orphan in family. And so I want to be really careful again to be honoring to our listeners. Family is, is a broad word in a very broken culture. God's work is to set every human heart into what he meant by family. And so your family may not look very traditional, but you can be assured when you're sleeping, God is awake. And it is on God's heart to see that every orphan and every orphaned place within each of us adults is being beckoned to come home to family. And that's the epicenter that was intended to be the church, whatever else church is. And so that's just an example of an on-ramp where every moment of every day, God's Mm -hmm. creating a fresh invitation. That's incredible. I love that. You want to say anything? Because before my next question, okay. Um, the renewal part, the the what now, I guess, is my question, because a lot of us, you know, will read, OK, and now now what? You know, you mentioned your journey from the beginning to where you are now. And there's a lot of listeners right now thinking, OK, I want more of that. What can I do? Where can I learn? Yeah. You know, Julia, I get a smile on my face because if you would have asked me that question 20 years ago. There would have been two responses, and one would have been pressure. I'm behind. Mm-hmm. I need to basically get my shit together. Mm-hmm. And the two, the second would have been some sort of performance, some sort of reaction that was out of my false self, my ego, that might have looked benevolent or altruistic. altruistic. It might have been like I'm a good businessman or a good husband or a good father, but largely it was motivated by a boy trying to use the world to answer his question. But now when you ask that question, I get the smile and I notice my internal sort of landscape and go, why am I smiling? And then I see the heart of God and I realize that the gospel that's been restored in me over 20 years and more 35 years of walking with God, but 20 years in this specific recovery is God is primarily interested in our restoration and repair. That God lives and breathes our initiation as men and women into wholehearted maturity. And that's what he's doing for our kids. And so we get to tune in. My primary work as a parent is to listen to God. 
and say, God, what have you put in Joshua, who's now 19, he just graduated from high school, he has his EMT, he's launched a gap year. God, what are you up to? What does he need? What are you doing and how can I participate? The pressure comes off because it's not primarily about me and it's I'm not the center of the story because there's an on-ramp. The Holy Spirit is always whimsically offering a way back to be good again, to be whole, to be restored. With God, this is like mind-bending, but I believe we are always on time. Mm -hmm. We are never behind. And so what I would say to every listener is notice the sorrow, notice the ache. Even if there's fear or apprehension, notice what's below that and try to access the pain and begin where you are, right here, and tune in rather than tune out to that part of your soul below the pressure, below the accusation, and that that young boy or young girl in you that's rising up, and just ask them, how old are you? Where did you first feel what you're feeling? What is it that you really need? What do you want to say? And then you can turn to God and say, God, what would you love to do for that young person? It's just a simple on-ramp to demonstrate that right today, God will always make an on-ramp to a narrow gate to recover the narrow path that says he knows us better than we know ourselves, that we are not primarily responsible to write our story. God's written it. Our primary work is responding, and that's where the pressure comes off. Mm -hmm. It's where it gets really exciting, and that's where he's a God of second chances, and that's where we find our hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that pressure comes off. I think that's really important for people to hear because it's that control that we feel like we have and what's going on. And we hold on to that control, some of us more than others, <laughs> where we feel like we're in control of the kids or what's going on. And once you do let go of that and realize you truly are not in control, you just want to, you know, you want to live God's will for you. It's, it's very refreshing. It really Julia, is. Let me ask you. Yeah. So six kids, eight to yeah. 23, That's you right. have some miles. I mean, like <laughs> take my shoes off. I have so much respect for you. Thank you. I could just sit here and listen to your stories. As mother, mm -hmm. the most noble and difficult role in the universe. Mm. So let me ask you, can you think of an example where you over time got to watch God orchestrate the journey of initiation into adulthood, into maturity, into wholeheartedness for one of your kids, where at the time you might have been fighting it or trying to control or confused or despairing. But when you look back, you realize it was actually an unbroken line. It was a shortest line possible that your son or daughter was being led and they are more whole and more well because of what you observed that now because of that, you, you might see it differently with your eight-year-old. Sure. Yeah. I, I remember um, our oldest, actually, when she was first, we first moved to Florida. So that it was what year? 2017. 2017. Thank you. Um, he's the number guy. Great. <laughs> I'm not. And we, she was just going to college, which was local here in St. Augustine. She went to Flagler. She wanted to go for film and, and uh, film and theater. theater. And I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> You know, we're very conservative, uh, religious, the whole thing. And she had her faith just, you know, she in her in her own way at the time. And I thought, OK. And everything in me as the mother is like, listen, that's not a good road to go down. The industry is not the best. You know, there's some interesting characters there. But for the whole year, she went. She had her classes. She learned a lot of great things. She worked with crazy tools to, to, to build stages. And she loved that part of it. I prayed a lot. I completely let go, 100% yeah, let go. I said, God, whatever you want, this is not my life. This is hers and whatever you want to happen. I noticed her faith growing over the over that year. 
And at the end of the year, she's like, mom, I think I'm going to change majors. And I said, mm. okay, tell me about that. She's like, I'm just not, not crazy about what we're learning about, you know? And I said, okay. So she went into youth ministry and theology <laughs> and, mm. and that she graduated with that. It was a moment of motherhood where usually, you know, we homeschool our kids. So it was like, here's the classes you're taking you know, we're going to do it now. This is, you know, it's complete control in a motherly way of, yes. you know, the schedule of the day. But it was the moment of surrender and letting go, not knowing what was going to happen, yes. not know if she was going to go down a bad road, maybe for 10 years. I had no idea, but I had to, because that's what we're supposed to do in a mm. sense. Do you know what I mean? But it's one of the hardest things because mm -hmm. we want to protect our kids. We want to shelter them from all the evils out there. But a lot of times we have to let them fall a little bit and get up mm. and just be there. Be there when they need us. Julia, that's more than hard. What you just described is impossible, right? You can't do that without a genuine life in God. Mm -hmm. And she's your first, for heaven's sakes, you're launching this beautiful creature out into the world, into theater, no less. Like, But what I hear you saying is what that did for her faith, mm -hmm. that actually the formation of her faith, that that it required an otherness, right? Mm -hmm. It required something challenging and out of the box and combative probably in a way. And I, the part of the story I'd love to hear from her of her getting to be a light in that world, because she probably wasn't from a lot of six kid homeschool families mm -hmm. in her theater department, right? Sure, sure. And and so I just love, and what it did for your faith, of you had to lean mm -hmm. into God and make prayers that really matter and to let go of outcomes. I mean, that is holy risk. That is courageous love. That's the impossible possible. And that is a beautiful picture mm -hmm. of initiation. Way to go, mom. Thank Way you. to go. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Morgan. <laughs> We could speak for the rest of the evening, oh, I but love this. before we do sign off, uh, I know my wife is smiling the whole time. This is I a mean, great... she's painted a really beautiful this is picture incredible. of herself. I mean, it's just no, really it great. wasn't beautiful. It was it was very difficult. I it heard was, her say yes. she controls the day. Now, for those of you out there, you should see what control means. Oh, when six kids it's, 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 it's it, chaos. Yes. It's not control. Yes, so. my, Gabriella, <laughs> that that daughter, she bought me this sign. It says this house is this house is made up of chaos and love. And yeah, you know, I love it. <laughs> I, I had one. I had one family that uh, they yeah. also have six kids, so they had to move to a farm because it was just too much. And he <laughs> said that on any given day, our property looks like we are definitely having a garage sale. And they said they've even had people stop by and ask what they're selling, going, "This is just us." It's like, so God awesome. bless you. God That's bless so you awesome. guys. It's the let go of that control too. I yes. think it's 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 chaotic control, and I love it. <laughs> Harnessed <laughs> strength. Where can the listeners get a hold of you, Morgan? Where, 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 where can they buy your book? Where can they go on the website? Where can they check yeah, it out? Yeah, and tell us a little bit about the events on your on the website too. Yeah, friends listening, our, our passion is for people to come home to the heart of God. That it, it moved from simply cerebral or even religious to intimacy, to genuine, authentic connection to recovering a path and process over time where, as Dallas Willard would say, more of me, more parts of me would come home to more parts of God, that I would find my life being rooted in God and God being rooted in me. And we want to see people thrive. We've been at it for nearly a quarter of a century. And yeah, it was birthed through Wild at Heart, which is our book for men, captivating for women. And then my work um, is the sort of deeper discipleship dive, the deeper apprenticeship. I wrote the book, Becoming a King, that goes deeper into the heart of a man. And so we offer retreats uh, around the world. You can find at wildatheart.org is a great location. We've got a weekly podcast. We've got um, the what, the pause app that's just, if you don't remember anything from this, the, the pause app, download it. It's got beautiful meditations. One thing I would add is we off, we took our retreats. We, we, we live relationally and we offer uh, our work out of community. And so we have, you know, wait lists for our events and lotteries and we have for, for all of our events. 
And so we found a way over years to video them and create this beautiful kit where any man and any woman can offer our retreats locally. And so we offer three retreats. It's the Wild at Heart Basic. It's the Captivating Core and the Becoming a King Retreat. And those three are now being offered by over a hundred allies this year. We have 140, I think the last time I checked of just the Wild Heart Basic this year uh, for free. It's all free. And all they do is grab a, a location and a handful of folks and they take men and women through these journeys. And so we have online resources, we have podcast blogs, but I do want to feature if you're going, I want the deep immersion with others. You can look for um, Water Heart Basic, Captivating Core, the Becoming a King Retreat.com, all of those you can find online. We do beautiful studies. And then we have the weekly podcast from Wild at Heart. And then the Becoming a King podcast is called Become Good Soil. And that's the deep dive of the slow and steady work that we're describing. Everything here we just touched on, but if you want to immerse yourself in it, I'd encourage you to check out the Become Good Soil podcast for more. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. As I always like to wrap the show, my wife loves it when I say I'm Gino, she's Julia, and we are Julia and Gino. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Morgan, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.